late morning, maybe it's early morning, depending where you are in the world. Uh, my name is Dennis Knopfsinger, and I will be uh, conducting the Tech Talk webinar today about understanding 802.11 Apple X-Ray AX, high efficiency wireless features. And um, that's what we're going to be talking about today. Now, my background, I've been in the wireless industry for 32 years. 32 years. Yes. And hello to you, by the way, in, in the chat. And um, yes, 10 years of my life started with a company called Telzon, T-E-L-X-O-N. Now, that was a play on the words of binary on and binary off for telephone binary communications. So, well, they're no longer tells on, they're tells off. They're no longer in business. But what do they do? They made barcode readers here in Akron, Ohio, where I'm talking from. And that was a, that it, well, it was a high-tech company uh, making these barcode readers. You pull the barcode reader trigger, beep, and type in a quantity and hit send. And they needed a radio company. So Telzon Corporation of Akron, Ohio, started a company you may have heard before called Aeronet. Aeronet uh, was our radio company that we started for our access points and the radios embedded into our devices. Well, around 1999, that is when uh, Telzon went out of business, but they spun off Aeronet and Cisco Systems acquired Aeronet in 1999. And that was the first 10 years of my career. Well, then 21 years with a company called GigaWave. It's, we're friendly, GigaWave, right? And GigaWave Technology was a learning partner with Cisco Systems. And uh, they were in business for 22 years. I was with them for 21. And uh, now I work for Sunset Learning Institute. I've been here about a, one year and four months, and who's counting, right? <laughs> so uh, I was in wireless before everyone called it Wi-Fi. So just a little bit about my background. And so what we're going to do, as far as our, our time here, the introduction I just completed, but we're going to talk about this 802.11 AX. There are so many amendments to the standards, they have to use two letters. So we're going to talk about what does Wi-Fi 6 mean and why is it called Hue? Who came up with that name? Well, I triple E did. So you'd have to uh, reach out to them if you don't like that name. But I do. It stands for High Efficiency Wireless. So the 802.11ax standard, the little ax, is an amendment to our wireless standard. And IEEE calls it Hue. And that's really the focus of this talk is how did they, IEEE, make wireless efficient? And then we're going to talk about 811ax. And there is an extension to that. And it's called Wi-Fi 6E for extended. Let me just check the chat window real quick. Okay. By the way, just started the session. If you um, are make you aware, we are recording the session for your viewing later on. So that is our agenda. Um, and at the end of the 45 minutes, uh, we'll open to questions. And I'll provide those answers. Okay, so you can put the questions you have in the QA section or in the chat. So, our first topic is Wi Fi 6. That looks interesting, kind of logo. It is, it's a Wi Fi 6 logo. And let me bring up the presentation screen. And now we're all set. As engineers that you all are, um, the standard 8011B 
as in Bravo. That's 1999. 11G as in George. That's 2003. 11A and G. Well, that came out, the A came out in 1999, G came out in 2003, but what you're noticing is this naming convention. Wi-Fi 1, Wi-Fi 2, Wi-Fi 3, and then in 2009, A11N as November was ratified, and they call it Wi-Fi 4. And then 2013 and 2018, A11AC was our new amendment to the standard. And they call it Wi-Fi 5. Now, who's they? Oh, that's Wi-Fi Alliance, which I'll introduce you at the end of the presentation with a web link because it is a company that certifies hardware to see if it meets the standards. So IEEE creates the standards, but Wi-Fi Alliance is in the business of verifying that the hardware, the access point, the mobile device, your tablet, your smartphone, your laptop will uh, meet the standard. And so they came out with our current standard. As we're sitting here right now, this came out in February of 2020. And it's called 811AX, Apple X-Ray. And it's called Wi-Fi 6. So Wi-Fi Alliance came up with this name, Wi-Fi 6, Wi-Fi 5, Wi-Fi 4, because not everyone like yourselves in the room are engineers. If you go to a computer store to buy a tablet, a smartphone, a router, you start seeing these alphabet letter soups flying all letters all over the place. And you're going, what is it going to work? So for the consumer, they use this name Wi-Fi 6. And we're going to talk about Wi-Fi 6 and Wi-Fi 6E. So what's nice about this is that we have the ability to have efficiency. We have the speed, we just have the efficiency. And so IEEE called it high efficiency wireless, which is you, right? And what we have is we've had the speeds, we had the feeds, we didn't have the efficiency. So they learned a thing or two from the cellular industry how to handle a mass quantity of smartphones on a cell tower, right? So we're not using cellular communications, we're taking a page from their playbook, if you will, and doing that. You know what? Maybe you've heard of IoT, Internet of Things, and Internet of Everything. You know, your refrigerator could be online. Your washer and dryer can be online. So you know that your clothes are washed on your smart phone device or be at the grocery store and you go, I don't know if we need milk or not and access your camera inside your refrigerator. Go, oh, I guess we do. It could be your doorbell is online, your security system or Internet of Things that are used in manufacturing. But AX is also going to provide extended range for bridge links. That's going to be from rooftop to rooftop bridge link. And so better performance, well, we've had performance, we just didn't have the efficiency. So one moment as I advance this page here. So what we have and we're going to talk about is we have higher data rates. 1,024 quadrature amplitude modulation up to 9.6 gigabits per second per radio. And if you have a single antenna, speeds up 1.2 gigabits per second. Now, 8 by 8 by 8 SS, what is that about? Well, the first number 8 is how many radios transmit at 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. The next number is how many radios receive at 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. And then the last 8 there in this case is how many spatial streams. 8 spatial streams are the capability of sending communications down to eight clients at once versus one at a time. I mean, that's going to be all the rage now because they didn't make access points with that capability. 
maybe if you look at your data sheet of your access point, it's maybe four by four with three spatial streams. But this is going to allow us to have augmented reality or virtual reality. So you don't have to go to work. You just put goggles on and, oh, I'm at work, right? <laughs> Maybe you wouldn't want that. But, uh, you know, for an operation in healthcare or in education. So who would not want to have increased capacity? Three to four times more throughput than our past standard called 811 Alpha Charlie. Now we're gonna be talking about this OFDM, orthogonal frequency division multiple access. That is where the high efficiency comes from. That'll be in the next page. So we're gaining more capacity because here's what's happening everyone. And I know you know this is happening because you live the life, you are designing and supporting your networks. But when someone shows up at your office, they don't just have one person, one device. It's one person with three devices at a minimum. You'll have a laptop, you'll have a smartphone, and you have a tablet. And we call that high density wireless. And one of the things that were done, added to the standard is called basic service set ID coloring, which we'll talk about. And what that helps with is the channel planning issues we've had, where we have something called code channel interference. Oh, and multi-user MIMO gains. Uh, maybe you've heard that our last standard called 811AC has something called multiple user. That means you can communicate from the access point to multiple clients at once, since not one at a time, one at a time. But that was only download. That was downstream from the AP, the client. Oh, we have multiple user upload as well. So the latency, is you'll see here later on, is going to be very, very, very small, very short latency. That's important to us because wireless is not a secondary network anymore. Everything is wireless by default, Ethernet by exception, meaning, have you bought a laptop lately? Where's the Ethernet port? There isn't one, right? It's got a very nice radio. And so if you want Ethernet, you plug into a USB to Ethernet adapter. So Internet of Things is becoming popular. It's been popular for a while, but we need to handle those hundreds, if not thousands of devices that might be thermostats in the kindergarten through 12th grade classrooms. It could be these devices that the children do use to scan in like work with their ID badge that they have come into the building or they have left the building. But one of the things that don't, doesn't get talked, out, talked a lot about, excuse me, is better battery life. They can put a man on the moon, but they can't give you a battery battery that lasts a whole week. Oh, well, you know, our devices have a cellular radio, Bluetooth radio, a very bright backlight right? Um, okay, so that battery is charging and being drained by all these radios. So we're going to get improved battery life with something called target wake time. So how did they make it efficient? Who's they? IEEE. Well, the first thing that they do, they always do, is they increase the modulation. Just to give you just a quick review about modulation is that friends don't let friends use dial-up, right? You know, the modem. If you remember those modem days, we have a copper wire that, you know, runs from your business or in your house, and we use it for hello and goodbye phones, right? And then modems came out, 300 baud, 1200 baud, 2400 baud, 9600 baud dsl speeds you know what didn't change that whole time the phone line we call it pots plain old telephone system well what did change the modulation became more advanced and if you've ever had that experience of a modem that you bought a high-end modem and you power it on and try to use it go well, why is it not as fast as i thought it would be 
It's because there's noise on your phone line. And it could be not your house. You could be rewire your house phone line, but it's the phone line going to the telco. So if you have more noise on your phone line, your modem cannot give you the faster speeds. Well, in wireless, it's not our phone line, but we have a 2.4 gigahertz and a six gigahertz carrier. Within that 2.4 gigahertz and that five gigahertz, we use more advanced modulation. And what this 64 quadrature amplitude modulation is showing you, you see all those little blue dots? They refer to them as celestial. Like if you want to look at the stars in the sky, you better be somewhere where it's pitch black. Not a lot of lights, you know, from street lights and city lights. Otherwise, you're not going to see it very well. We would call that light pollution. As your modulation increases, get the faster speeds, you have to have less RF noise pollution, if you want to look at it that way. And so if you look at those dots, they're getting closer together. So this is 64 quadrature amplitude modulation. That's six bits per symbol. And then we get to 256 quadrature amplitude modulation. Now this happened with our 811 AC standard. Look at how close those dots are, right? That's eight bits per symbol. Well then, and where we're at now, it's 1,024. Those uh, dots are orange, as you see, it looks like fabric. That's 10 bits per symbol. So we have to improve the modulation encoding technique. It becomes more advanced, but we need to have a quiet, quieter ARF environment. So that's the first thing that they've been doing all these years as standards become ratified because the IEEE working group says, okay, what's our current standard? Standard? How we make it faster? Well, first thing, modulation, right? Then you get into the spatial streams. You know, one of the things they did was they came out with two spatial streams and three spatial streams and four spatial streams. And a spatial stream at best, no guarantee, is be about 150 megabits per second per stream. So when they first came out with this, you had two spatial streams, that's 300, because 150 plus 150. Then they had three spatial streams, 150 plus 150 plus 150 is 450 megabits per second. And they've been going faster ever since. But here's the problem. The problem is, sure, my access point has three spatial stream capabilities, but your client device needs that many radios too. So if you want to take advantage of three spatial streams, you have to have three radios in your client device. A lot of client devices only have one radio. So anyways, excuse me, the eight spatial streams is the max they have currently. But what they were able to do is have upload and download multiple user MIMO. What that means, instead of sending three or four spatial streams to one client, why not just send a singular spatial stream to four clients at once? And the clients can communicate upstream upload and the AP can talk download. Pretty amazing. Well, one of the things we've been talking about before we're done today is that we know that we've always had a 20 megahertz wide channel. That's the way it has been for a while. But then around 19, to the, actually 2009, 40 megahertz wide channel was introduced. And that was with our 802.11 n as November standard. Then an 80 megahertz wide channel. And that was introduced in 2013 with the 802.11 AC standard. And then 160 megahertz wide channel. That was introduced in 2018 with the 802.11 AC Alpha Charlie Wave 2 standard. If you look at that diagram, do you see how there are less blue channel patterns to just want the others are a problem? And so we call it channel bonding or a wide channel. And truth be told, the problem you'll have in, we have in the industry right now is that 40 megahertz really did give you a big improvement in speed. That's actually two channels per radio. 80 megahertz wide channel is four channels per radio. 
160 megahertz is eight channels per radio in your five gigahertz radio in your access point. You're going to run out of channels. So what we have found is great on paper, but in reality, an 80 and a 160 megahertz wide channel didn't give us that boost we we're kind of expecting because we're consuming a lot of our channels up. And so here's a really good note here about channel bonding that's actually addressed in Wi-Fi 6E as in extended. Channel bonding reduces the range as the power spread out across the additional 20 megahertz channels. That's adding a three decibel penalty to signal noise ratio. I'm gonna stop right there. So if you have a 20 megahertz wide channel like we've always have, great. But then you do channel bonding, 20 plus 20 is 40. That's a three decibel penalty to your signal noise ratio, which is a lot. Well, if you were to use an 80 megahertz wide channel, you doubled your channel again. That is a six decibel penalty to your signal noise ratio. So that channel bonding has a penalty, right? Hmm, what are we gonna do? Well, maybe go to six gigahertz, you'll see that in just a moment. But the greater the quadrature amplitude modulation, the harder it is for the receiver to decode, therefore is more sensitive to noise. That's the reality. To go faster, you have to have a quieter RF environment. So this is what's behind all of the details of high efficiency wireless. That's called a resource unit, okay? A resource unit. And what it's all about is, I'm gonna turn the page and come right back, is that what we've been using for a really long time is something called OFDM, Orthogonal Frequency Division Multiplexing. And that has a 64 subcarriers. They are broken in down to a 312.5 kHz wide channel. So you have 64 subcarriers that are 312.5 kHz wide. If you divide that by four, you get 78.125 kHz. They call that orthogonal frequency division multiple access. That's the magic word here that makes wireless efficiency, Q. What they call these are resource units. Sometimes we refer to them as tones. And so what we're gonna learn here is that OFDM, what we've been using for years, is divided into large subcarriers, but only one user can ride the frame at a time over the air. But with OFDMA, you can assign individual users a resource unit, multiple users per frame in the air. Hmm. So we go back to this previous page. Imagine we've all used Amazon, right? And you order things from Amazon, but let's say Amazon only uses the same size box, no matter what you are buying. If we're a mouse, same size box. A candlestick, same size box. A piano, a sofa, same size box every single time. And every box can only be delivered once at a time to you. Can't load up the whole truck one at a time. So one huge delivery or one small delivery, always in the same size box. So if I sell sofas and pianos, I'm gonna have one big box to put your mouse into for your computer or your candlestick, right? Doesn't sound very efficient. Well, that's what OFDM is doing. Your size of your data may not fill all the space up that can be used, utilized. So a lot of wasted space. Cisco Systems is, has uh, evaluated their customers' networks and found that 87.3%, 87.3% of the, your customers' network with wireless, their frames are less than 320 bytes. That's like a mouse or a candlestick. You don't need a big box. Well, you could, but you can put a lot more data into that box and ship it all at once. That's what a resource unit is. A resource unit is the right size box to ship what they need to ship to you and not some ridiculously huge box, right? 
Now the example shown here is a 20 megahertz wide channel. With this, you actually have nine users per 20 megahertz. And there's more at 40, there's more at 80, and there's more at 160, but the example here is 20. So how come they get to nine, right? 26 and 26, if you see that, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Well, that's eight, Dennis, correct. But there's 13 and 13 there, and that's 26. So a lot of times your internet of things, your internet of everything devices don't need a lot of bandwidth. They don't take up a lot of space in the transmission. So a smaller size box, a smaller resource unit like 26 can be used. Now, 52 will be a larger size box for a larger amount of data. And that's what makes it more efficient. In this way, let me uh, get to this next page here. So on the left, we have OFDM. Think of it as being like a truck. And all that gray space is an empty truck. So you have that dark red, you have that darker orange, a lot of wasted space. However, with OFDMA, you can see that time one, there's light blue for user eight, which is voice over IP. You have um, your green, which is user five, which is data. In time two, you see dark blue, which is user seven, which is data. You have orange, which is user three, video. Dark red, which is voice over IP. That uh, kind of mustard yellow is user four, voice over IP. And user six is Internet of Things. So you can see that we will make more efficiency by loading up the frame as much as we can with the proper size resource unit and go ahead and send that to the users. The next thing they did, they being IEEE, is called coloring, basic service set color. For years, if you've been in the industry, you've always heard, well, we have channel 1, 6, and 11 at 2.4 gigahertz. And those are the non-overlapping channels. They don't conflict with each other. 5 gigahertz, depending on what country you live in, United States, you can use all 25 channels. They do not interfere. But because of high-density environments, our access points are coming closer together, and there's a likelihood for access points channels to conflict. When you have an access point channel, it's on the same channel, it's called co-channel interference. The word co and channel starts the letter C. They're two different words. You have two APs that are different, but they're on the same channel, let's say 48 and 48. They're going to conflict. And what the way the standard will work is those access points will have to hold off and not transmit. They have to defer. So you get communications, but it'd be very slow. So if you do a packet capture, you're not going to see pink, yellow, orange, silver as colors in the header. No, you're going to see a number from 0 to 63. And that numbering system indicates the color. And what that does, the terminology is called an overlapping basic service set ID. So overlapping basic service set ID is that our problem is we've always had the potential of APs on the same channel too close to each other. So in this example, we have a, a one in dark blue and we have a one in light blue on the right. They're not of the same color, light blue and dark blue. So therefore, when they hear each other, the APs do on the same channel, they will not have to defer. They will not have to hold off transmitting. They can go ahead because the signal threshold that if you're below that signal threshold, we're not going to conflict with each other. But if there was a dark blue one nearby a dark blue one, then they would defer. And this is also performed at 2.4 gigahertz as well. So 2.4 is no longer considered the junk band. No longer the junk band. It's still around. Uh, we need it for barcode readers, EKG means, machines, IV pumps, right? Things like that guest access maybe, but um, the 2.4 gigahertz doesn't, didn't go away. Yay, it's still here. It just simply needs to work and coexist with other devices. And so they have 
target wake time, which we're going to be talking about in just a moment to improve battery life. And they do use the basic service set coloring option to help channel reuse, because really at 2.4, there's only three channels that are non-overlapping, 1, 6, 11, right? The target wait time is a power save mechanism, but the industry doesn't like to say it's power save, they like to say it's a scheduler. And the access point can schedule clients when they can go to sleep and wake up. The old way was you have to wake up every 102.4 milliseconds. I don't know about you, but if you had to wake up every 102.4 milliseconds, you might not feel very rested, right? So the access point will tell clients when they can go to sleep and when they can wake up. And that way, your battery life is extended because your, most of your current draw from your battery is mostly when you transmit, but you also have to receive. And so it might seem ridiculous up to five years, but that is the max. Well, why would they do something like that? Well, they did that for Internet of Things and Internet of Everything. For an example, in a bridge, they can put a sensor in a bridge and that sensor in the bridge is going to measure temperature, vibration, moisture of that bridge. And let's say it wakes up once a month, transmits, and goes back to sleep. Wakes up once a month, transmit, goes back to sleep to save battery life because it's embedded in the concrete, right? So five years from now, it wakes up and, oh, it's a completely different access point, possibly, right? So that's gonna improve our battery life, but we still get performance. And by the way, we will have backwards compatibility. So there is coexistence that in this example, the blue portion of that frame going out is your traditional legacy protocols. And then the orange would be our 811AX. So there is coexistence. Now, one second, please. But wait, there's more. There's Wi-Fi 6E, and it what is it about? And as I conclude our presentation, so we'll give you a quick primer on what is this about Wi-Fi 6E? Is, it, is E for excitement? Could be, should be, but it really means for extension in the channel. Now, it depends where you live. I don't you know, everyone might be for all parts of the world, but this, uh, this document that I'm using here, FCC, in April of 2020, said, so, okay, you can use the six gigahertz band. I lived 32 years of those 35 years in the Wi-Fi business, and this is amazing. 1,200 megahertz of spectrum. So there's a link down here. It's from Wi-Fi Alliance, and that's where you can see if your country is adopting the six gigahertz band. But what's all the excitement about, right? Exactly. Who wouldn't want 1,200 megahertz of more channels? Well, Wi-Fi 6E is promoting a wireless-first approach, meaning wireless is how we connect now. Forget Ethernet. We're not going to use Ethernet, right? So from portable computers to desktop computers to tablets to Internet of Thing devices, temperature sensors, healthcare, wearables, voice over IP. We're always wanting to use wireless, but it needs to be quick, low latency, right? And that's what we'll be able to have. Now, here is the good news or the bad news, okay? The good news is this is a completely green field. Every time a standard comes out, I always say, I wish we could just say, too bad to be you. You have to have the new radio for you to connect. Nope, we always have to be backwards compatible. Well, that makes sense, right? But Wi-Fi 6E, they saw an opportunity to be green field, an all new fresh page. So it requires Wi-Fi 6 capability. Wi-Fi 6 or Wi-Fi 6E as in extended OFDMA only. Why? Well, those legacy devices are not as efficient and they take more of the airtime. And their magic protocol overhead takes more time as well. 
So we truly are turning a page here to a fresh blank slate with wireless. So we will have lower latency, um, less than two milliseconds for high density environments. We're gonna enjoy the same kind of speeds that we have seen with 802.11ax, but now this is six gigahertz band. We'll have a cleaner band, less noise and congestion, but stop the presses. You have to use WPA3. That is our 2018 standard from January of 2018, replacing WPA2. What opportunist wireless encryption is called OWE is we'll be using your hotspots like your hotels, your coffee shop, your guest network. For years, the person connected to the open network just has to know, oh, I have to use a VPN if I want to secure my session at the coffee shop, right? Well, what WPA3 OWE does, it allows for a secure connection with really no intervention of the user. They will get an, a, an automatic key to encrypt that traffic. So we will no longer have a wide open network for guests, that's good. Uh, simultaneous authentication of equals is a mouthful to say, but it's replacing the WPA and WPA2 pre-share key. The WPA and WPA2 pre-share key was called the personal security for the homeowner. And it has been used at work for barcode readers and phones, believe it or not, and uh, kiosks and things like that. But this vulnerability is someone saying, Hey, what's your pre-share key you use around here? Oh, it's Rover, dog's name Rover, capital R, and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, thank you. They can join your network, right? And so simultaneous authentication equals is not new. It was used in wireless, it is used in wireless mesh networks, but someone knowing your passphrase does not exploit your network, pardon me, your network. And then WPA3 Enterprise would be you're using a RADIUS server to authenticate the users and you have to practice WPA3 Enterprise um, options. So that's a must do for six gigahertz. Now, power. The power is important here because if you're going to migrate to Wi-Fi 6E, you have to look at your switches. You're going to need 60 watts of power at minimum. Well, the standard we have right now, 802.3 Alpha Tango, is where it's at, but that's only 30 watts per port. Well, why do we need 60 watts? Well, that does mean you're going to have to buy probably a new switch or switches or get a power injector that is made for it. But what happens is that we have access points now that have a 2.4 gigahertz radio, a five gigahertz radio and a six gigahertz radio, and even Bluetooth, low energy radio, even an internet of things radio called Zigbee. It may have a USB port because some APs allow you to put a USB memory stick into your AP to launch applications from it. So if you don't have the 60 watts required, you'll get reduced functionality of your AP. So Wi-Fi 6E in our current channels, 2.4 and 5 gigahertz, as you well know, we have channel 1, 6, and 11. But at 5 gigahertz, we have 80, 40, 160, 20 megahertz wide channels. We need 80 megahertz to get that 1 gigabit per second. So you have eight, sorry, six 80 megahertz channels in the United States and five 80 megahertz wide channels in Europe and even less in other countries. So a limitation of wide channels is trying to support more users, more APs, you exhaust your channel plan, meaning your channels are now conflicting with each other. Oh, and don't forget about our radar that can be detected. That's we're sharing that bandwidth. If radar is detected, we have to get out of the way. We can't use that channel. And so as I finish up this presentation, you're going to see the UNIs here. That stands for Unlicensed National Information Infrastructure. It simply means hey, we don't need a license. Okay. And so we have our channel kind of broken up for us. Well, so what's going to happen is the six gigahertz band gives us 1200 megahertz of contiguous Wi-Fi channel access. 
So we have 14 channels, 1480 megahertz channels, I should say, seven 160 megahertz channels, and Wi-Fi 6E spectrum will allow us to shine with our speeds because we can use that 1200 megahertz of continuous channel. So you can see in this different, this, this chart here, 59, 20 megahertz wide channels, 29, 40 megahertz wide channels, 14, 80 megahertz wide channels, and seven 160 megahertz wide channels. We have different power classes though. So in the next few slides, we're gonna talk about standard power, low power, very low power, portable indoor outdoor and clients. So standard power is gonna be a big issue. It's the, it's the standard class for outdoor wireless. So you have to follow the power requirements. You cannot go over 36 dBm of power, that's called effective isotrophic rate of power, and as your power limit coming off the antenna. So if you're going to use 6E, 6 gigahertz outside, the hardware that you'll be installing will communicate to a automatic frequency coordination service, which would be managed by the regulatory domain, FCC, for example. When you go to set up this hardware, it has to check in with the automatic frequency coordination service. And if six gigahertz is already being used, it'll suggest different channels you could use or you can't use it at all. We'll use it at all. Do we have this just to ourselves? No, no, we have um, fixed services that are out there. They're not moving, um, but they're using six gigahertz. Satellite services, television broadcasts, this just in, we have a snowstorm coming, live broadcast, and who knows where that van will show up. So they use the word incumbent, meaning there are other users of the six gigahertz band, we have to be respectful to that. And so in a six gigahertz band, the access points will be in the low power indoor category. The power will be reduced and our building material will attenuate the signal so that we will not bleed out to the street and cause problem with incumbent services, services that are already using six gigahertz. The magic to Wi-Fi 6E is something called power spectral density. And I'm gonna show you the mathematics of that in just a few moments here. But that's gonna be the key to unlocking Wi-Fi 6's potential. So what are known issues at five gigahertz? Well, channel bonding requires contiguous spectrum of channels and our channels are all broken up. We have gaps. And we just learned that by bonding channels, you get a three decibel penalty for 40 megahertz wide channel to your signal noise ratio and a six decibel penalty to your 80 megahertz wide channel. Six decibel penalty is big. Oh, but six gigahertz has a power spectral density. For that 1200 megahertz of continuous spectrum, the FCC at five gigahertz has six 80 megahertz wide channels, but at six gigahertz, we have eight. No, sorry. Six gigahertz band is maximum 14 80 megahertz wide channels, right? So the maximum power for Wi Fi 6E indoors is five dBm to your frequency megahertz called your power spectral density, which you'll see in a moment. And I'll show you the, this translates to three decibel maximum power being added. So here you go. The power spectral density is five decibel to megahertz mathematics. Ooh, that sounds fun, right? Well, what you have here is five dBm converted to milliwatts is 3.162278 milliwatts. So 5 dBm equals 3.162278 milliwatts times 20 megahertz, which is your channel band. That's 63.24556 milliwatts or 18 dBm. That's why you see that in the chart here. 5 dBm is still 3.162278 milliwatts times 40 is 126.4911 milliwatts or 21 dBm. That's why you see 21 right there. So 80 megahertz, if you do out the math, you'll see that's 24 dBm. And 160 megahertz, that's 27 dBm. So they're encouraging you to use wider channels and rewarding you for that because you have more power 
to compensate for that noise. Clients that are Wi-Fi 6, they have a new rule. You have to reduce your power by six decibels to whatever the AP you're connected to is. I know I need to finish up here real quick and I'm almost there. <laughs> but the AP is operating in this example at low power indoor. And so if you have an access point that's a 20 megahertz wide channel, that means you are looking at 18 dBm, but you have a penalty. Eh, it's not the right word, penalty. It's, it's a new rule. Six decibel decrease, that's 12 dBm. If you're on a 40 megahertz wide channel, 21 dBm, six decibel, reducing your power, that's 15 dBm. 80 megahertz is 24 dBm, minus a six decibel reduction in your power, 18 dBm, 160 megahertz, 27 dBm, that comes down to 21 dBm. The last power is called very low power, targeted to small cell coverage, hotspots, cars, and trains. And they're a negative, you're not seeing this incorrect, that's correct, negative eight dBm in megahertz. And so negative eight dBm equals point, 158, 4893, 1925 milliwatts. And like the same example, you multiply that by your channel width. So 20 megahertz is 5 dBm, 40 megahertz would be 8 dBm, 80 megahertz would be 11 dBm, and 160 megahertz will be 14 dBm. When comparing six gigahertz to five gigahertz, the frequency is about the same, the wavelength. So the attenuation or the signal loss is close in their testing that Cisco did. And if you're wondering, is Wi-Fi 6 going somewhere? Nope, it's here to stay. Plenty of 2.4 gigahertz devices out there and five gigahertz. But I wanna see, if my device is Wi-Fi 6E, 6 gigahertz, well, Wi-Fi Alliance is where to go. Their web link is right here. So Fujitsu example, Intel example, and a Motorola example. The information you just saw came from the white paper from Cisco system called the Next Great Chapter in Wi-Fi white paper. And the other beginning part was Wi-Fi 6 came from understanding Cisco Wireless Foundation's curriculum. So I'm going to check the Q&A button real quick to see if there's any questions. I do not see any questions being posted and I'm looking in the chat window. Give a moment though for you to do that if you'd like to enter anything into the chat window or in the question answer. Because we have like uh, five minutes, if I, uh, you're welcome. Hey, thank you for those comments. I very much appreciate that. Well, I'll um, wait here for another five minutes, four minutes, unless um, you don't have other questions. But please remember this. Wi-Fi 6 is not going anywhere. It is our current standard. The speeds are amazing. And there's a lot of devices you need to support. Oh, you're welcome and thank you. Thank you, Vince. Thank you, George. Because we have a lot of 2.4 gigahertz and five gigahertz devices, but the six gigahertz is going to um, start taking off here and access points are starting to become available for the enterprise. The small office, home office has had it for a little while too. And in my experience, when a new standard is ratified, it takes 12, to 18 months for the radio technology to be affordable in everyday common devices. Oh, sure, they have these top end devices that are out there. You know, the Cadillac, you know, the Bugatti of the laptops, but you can't afford that for everybody. So we are at that point where 811 Apple X-Ray Wi-Fi 6 is gonna be supported. Definitely. Hey, thank you very much. Well, I do not see any more questions posted in the Q&A or in chat window. So I wanna thank you for your time that you spent with me and maybe look forward to seeing you in a class sometime here in the future. Again, my email address is dnoffsinger 
at sunsetlearning.com. And thank you for your time. Have a great Tuesday. Akron is not a technical place. Um, hi, Martin. Um, Akron is, is not really that technical at all. Back, but then Telzon was the highest tech thing around at the time. But I will say that uh, Cisco Systems, when they acquired Aeronet, they, they have a facility in Richfield, Ohio, which is about 45 minutes from here. And I had to say they would definitely be technical there for sure. But Akron as a as in general note, not very technical. Yes, yes, we thank you. Seven signal. Yes, in Independence, Ohio. And Tom Carpenter is in Maryland, uh, Marysville, Marysville, Ohio. And yes, uh, CWMP. Yes, for sure. And he's probably um, a couple hours away from me here. Tom Carpenter, yeah, very good. Thank you, Martin. And thank you, everyone else. Take care.